Well, hello, everybody. Welcome on in. I'm Justin Brennan. Uh, if you do not know anything about me, quick little synopsis. Uh, Mid-40s, born and raised San Diego, California. Uh, been fortunate enough to travel all around the United States and around the world. Grew up a little bit from family. So my grandmother, God bless her soul, up to 91 years of age, she was doing real estate, driving around, collecting rent on her apartment buildings. <laughs> And then, you know, my dad kind of learned from here or from her, you know, he was the transitional character in our family. We were never like super rich, but he was the one that kind of took us from being like middle class, I would call it, right? Living in a three bedroom, two bath home on Dory Road and went out, made it, made it big. I became a multimillionaire, did very, very, very well for himself, but he was always in the build and sell game, build and sell, right? So you go and you build houses, you build condos, you build apartment complexes and you build and you sell and you build and you sell. And that's great. You make a lot of money, but you can also get caught if you get into a market cycle and you're not ready and you're over leveraged. And that happened to him in 2008, the financial crisis, as we all are aware of, but it taught me a lot. Uh, I became an asset manager for the banks at that time, helping them just uh, dispose of their properties, right? And we were doing all of that around the country is like kind of the foreclosure crisis and all that stuff, as you remember, was going down. So, but how that got me into multifamily because I watched what my dad went through and I realized, listen, I, I want to go big in the real estate game. I just need to sleep at night <laughs> and I need the more steady Eddie. I don't need the roller coaster approach. I can do this approach. And so apartment buildings were the name of the game because you can get into single family rentals or even other things. But I saw apartments and multifamily is the name in the game because you can get in and cash flow these things, and people need three things. They need food, water, and shelter. Food, water, and shelter. And you play a massive role in that because people either rent or they own, right? You rent or you own. And more people are renting than they are owning today, mainly because we're moving to a renter nation, away from a true ownership nation. And that's just, we're following the footsteps of Europe. We're about 10 years behind, but we're following those footsteps, and the data proves it. So one in four homes, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, one in four homes in the United States of America today are owned by an institutional firm off of Wall Street. Did you know that? 25%, one in four homes in the United States of America are owned by institutional Wall Street firms. So big push to own these properties, get into rentals, and then renter nation. So why not share in that and become that? And that's why you're here tonight. So I love that. Cool. But that's a little bit of my background. And then from that, like we started with one condo in the midst of the financial crisis, 2010. And I went to a business partner of mine, Christopher Pulley at that time, who was in tech. I was getting hammered in real estate. He was in tech. He could help provide some capital, right? He could sign on our first loans. I brought the knowledge, the ability to execute, find, analyze, put deals together, raise capital, structure, manage the whole nine yards, a lot of sweat equity. And for that, we, farm, we firmed uh, our company, uh, Brennan Pulley Group. And so we started with a $100,000 condo in Murrieta, California, in the midst of the financial crisis. Then we went to duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. And then we realized, oh my gosh, this is great, but we're running out of our own money. So this is kind of where the game of, okay, how do we use our money in conjunction with other people's money to scale our portfolio and grow? And that's where we went from about 20 units at that time to now having just under 600 units and about $180 million in assets. And that's where we're at today. So that is my background, just to kind of give you a little synopsis of where I'm at and where we're going and, 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 and what's going on. So we're out there buying units right now. We are in escrow on a couple of deals, but I'm going to kind of walk you through this evening how you can buy a multifamily apartment building in the next 90 days with as little as, say, fifteen dollars to $30,000 out of pocket. So how does that sound? Here we go. So people ask me why multifamily? Right? Why multifamily versus single family rentals versus Airbnb versus other types of investment vehicles? Why multifamily? When I say multifamily, five units or more. Okay, five units or more is considered multifamily. Anything less than that, a two, three, four unit property, technically is multifamily, but it's still classified as a residential asset, just so you know that. Okay. So, why multifamily? The main reasons are this you get paid five to eight times over the course of the ownership. In the beginning, in the middle, in the end, you're paid, right? Some recurring stuff, some big chunk stuff, but five to eight times throughout the ownership cycle of the asset. 
Okay, it's a key component. You go flip a house, one time. Wholesale a house, one time. Airbnbs, you got some recurring, right? But not five to eight, right? You get the recurring, you get some tax benefits and these things, decent model, but it's not five to eight, okay? Econ economies of scale. You know, I just had a buddy that uh, had 12 single family rentals in one little general neighborhood area. And that was great. They didn't have to go too far. And they were all generally in with a good area. But he's like, man, I'm getting tired. I got, you know, 12 different roofs, 12 different insurance policies, right? I have a tenant move out of my property. I go from 100% occupied to zero. You know, I got 12 of this, 12 of that, right? All these things. I said, I totally get it, man. Why don't you just have one building that has 12 units in it in one location? And you can get economies of scale. And his response to me is, well, Justin, I, I, told, I believe that is the right way to go. I just, it's scary. I don't understand it. I know a house. I just don't know a building. I don't know how to finance it. I don't know how to put it together structurally. I don't know how to actually go from zero to hero. Like, how do you do this? We're going to go over that this evening. Okay. But that is kind of the fears he was going through. So I'm sure they're similar to what you are. But economies of scale, it's easier to finance. And then generational wealth. See, these are all the main things and most of these resonate with you and you know a lot about them already, okay? So we're gonna go through them tonight. Here we go. So question for you, money is, money is. What is money to you? Money is, and this, I'm gonna share with you a short version of what was explained to me about a year ago because I'd never heard the game of this in this way. So tell me if this starts to resonate. So money is all the things you discuss, totally right. But money is really a game. It's really a game. Because if you believe in this, okay, capitalism and the free market system, money is a game. And in this game of capitalism in the United States of America, you have two folks involved. You have creators and you have contributors. You have creators and you have contributors. Creators are business owners. That's why you're here tonight. Entrepreneurs, right? 1099. You're trying to leave the man of the W-2 world where you're working for somebody in a rat race, making everybody else money. You come over here and, hey, I'm ready to go, right? I can still use this over here, but we're going to double hustle in the short term until my income over here overtakes the income maybe I'm making here. Because maybe you're a W-2 employee. Working nine to five, getting your Friday paycheck. All of that stuff's awesome. And you want to say, okay, great, I get that. But here's where all the generational wealth, here's where all the freedom is at. Free time, travel, all these things you want to do. You're right. It is right over here. But understanding that there are creators and contributors. Creators create products and services. They put them into the marketplace. Contributors pay for them. And then the money leaves the pocketbooks of the contributors and it comes right over to the pocketbooks of the creators. And it is that cycle. And the IRS, they are friends at the IRS. <laughs> they love creators. They don't really love contributors. And you may be asking yourself, what do you mean? Well, look at it in the tax code. All the tax benefits come over here to the creators. Very few write-offs and tax benefits come over here to the contributors. Why? Why? Because you're not moving enough money. If you are over here as a contributor, you're not creating or moving enough money in the capitalistic system in the United States. So the IRS looks at you and says, okay, you're not moving a lot of money. We need people to move money, create capital, capitalism. Hence the reason they give all the benefits to the creators and then in a way punish the contributors you only have limited write-offs. So if you want the financial freedom, the generational wealth, and all these things, you have to do the business ownership side. You have to become an entrepreneur. But that's why you're here. Okay, Owning real estate is not, in terms of what we're talking about this evening, it's not like, hey, I'm going to go one, buy one property and completely be passive, and I can just throw a bunch of money at it, and I don't have to be engaged from a business ownership standpoint. No, you're going to hustle and make this happen for you. But it's extremely worth it because you can get very wealthy with it extremely wealthy with it. But you have to understand that you are essentially going to be starting a business. You're becoming a creator by doing this, by going out there and starting an investment company that's going to go buy real estate and do these things. We're going to show you how to do that and hold your hand. It's really, really critical. Does this make sense to anybody listening, creators and contributors? Beautiful. But that is the system. 
because the IRS is going to give the most amount of benefits to these folks. Why? Because they want them to create and move money, create jobs and opportunities and growth and all these things. So these, they can get very, very, very rich. And the IRS isn't doing it out of their pure heart. <laughs> They're basically saying, we're going to delay the gratification greater, let you get super rich greater. At some point, we're going to get a piece of ours, but it's going to be of a bigger pie. That's why they're doing it. And they're allowing you to get all these write-offs so you can actually grow this wealth, get to the point you want to go, and then they get a piece of a bigger pie. Versus over here, they're going to limit your write-offs because you're just, you know, getting a Friday paycheck, right? Maybe doing well, but getting a Friday paycheck and moving through. Because of that, you get your basic deductions and that's it. Because you're not creating enough wealth and movement of money. And that's how it works. So beautiful. So that is the game of money. Uh, who here, because you're here tonight, you obviously want to buy multifamily real estate, but do you understand that you're creating a business by doing that? Show of hands, thumbs up or thumbs down if you're understanding that that's how this really, this game works. And if you want all these things you're talking about, it's going to be in this mechanism over here. Okay, beautiful. Love it. Here we go. The seven mountains that move a nation inspire people. I recently literally got back from a Patrick Bet David conference last week down in Florida. And once again, he brought this up in front of everybody at that conference, about six, 7,000 people. These are the things I want you, and I want to get a pull up real quick from you as to what are your mountains, okay? All that apply. You have sports and culture, family, media, government, business, education, and religion. Which three or four of these are you most passionate about? And why this is so important is because money's only going to get you so far. It's only going to get you so far. There's got to be some core, like, mm, things that passion, like really get things moving in your belly and get you excited in life. Because money's going to get you motivated and get you going, but it won't keep you going through the tough times. These things will. For me, you have to have a successful business. The business helps for me fund, you know, how do we educate, right? How do we do media? And then how do we give back and leave a legacy? And how do we help our family, our personal family? But then how do we help others? Give back, leave a legacy, right? Philanthropy. That's where the family side's at. But these are my four. It's like, it literally goes kind of in this order. Two, three, four. Curious on yours. I'm going to stop that and share. Family's a big one, I think, for everybody. I love that. Business is right there. The education, sports and culture, religion. I love that nobody put government. They're like, screw this election stuff. <laughs> Beautiful. It sounds like business is strong for everybody. Family strong for everybody. Uh, you got government in there. I'm not, no government in there. And then you got the religion side, sports and culture. So that seemed like that's there. Very, very important for you to keep these kind of at your core. Because as you move through it, that's what's going to get you out of bed every morning when you don't want to get out sometimes. That's going to keep you moving towards that North Star. You're saying, gosh, this is why I'm really doing it. Right, whatever passions are inside of it. Hey, how can we create a successful business that then helps fund and feed some of the other passions that you have? Philanthropy may be a huge one for you, giving back and helping others. So really, really, really key. Okay, love it. So when I talked about, you just saw it, the passions, the education and the family philanthropy and community, right? So we created multifamily school and it was created a couple of years ago, mainly because I had a lot of people approaching me saying, hey, Justin, we're seeing everything you're doing. You're out there buying these multifamily apartment buildings around the country and it's super exciting. Can you teach it? And at first I said, like, no, because I don't really have the time. But then I said, OK, what if we put some just courses people can take at their own pace online? And we did that. But then people came in, they said, we love that stuff, but we really want more handholding. We want to like be a part of a community where people are collaborating, partnering, doing deals, like all these things. Um, can you mentor? Can you hold hands? Like, can you do this stuff? And at first I said, well, we can't do like one-on-one -on -one mentors. I don't have time for that. But we can create an incredible community of well-trained investors who are mentored and taught of how to execute and how to go from zero to whatever they want to do. And then by doing that, now you're trained enough to where let's partner, let's do bigger deals. Let's do deals where, hey, you started with a 1020 unit and now you want to go into a 100 or 200 unit deal, but you can't do it alone. That's how partnerships happen. Okay. We would have never gotten to our 600 plus units where we're at doing it alone. We can't write $30 million checks, but by coming together with our partners, that's how we've taken down large deals. So same thing in this case, you start where you're at in small 10, 20, 30 unit deal. 
Then you graduate up into the next stage and then you graduate into stages bigger than that. But that's why we created multifamily schooled community. We have well-trained investors around the country who are being taught and trained well in executing so they can go partner and collaborate together. How's that sound? But that's why it was there. So that's kind of the history behind it. Some of the mentees and the people in the community having fun, learning, doing all this stuff. I love it. And this is what, right? Once again, this is a passion for me. It like fulfills me to watch people have success, get rich, find multifamily, do this stuff for their family because now they can go spend time, have the freedom, financial wealth, generational wealth, all the things that they're really, truly trying to accomplish. Because money is a great motivator, but it's not going to keep you going. But it's amazing how much fulfillment you get by helping others. It's truly amazing. And at the same time, we're helping ourselves because now we're partnering with people and growing and finding bigger deals that we otherwise may not even find in the get-go, okay? But that's what it's all about. So buying apartments. These are the five steps to buying an apartment building. And I don't care if it's a two-unit deal or a 100-unit deal, okay? Or plus, same process. You have to know how to find them correctly. Analyze them quickly. Is it a good deal? Finance them. Close escrow. And then how do you manage this property once you've closed it? These are the five steps to buying an apartment building. So how do you make money in multifamily? Remember I said earlier, there's five to eight different ways. In some cases, even more than that. I'm going to go through them really briefly and we're going to get into it. So how do you make money? Way number one is an acquisition fee. This is a one-time fee paid to you for putting the deal together for you and your limited partners. Like you were saying, Peter, we're gonna show you that. So when you buy a multifamily building with OPM, other people's money, you're taking some of your money, say 15, 30, 40,000 bucks. You're taking other people's money and you're putting it together to go buy this one, $2 million plus apartment building. And I'm gonna show you how we structure that. But by doing that and putting in all that effort and work, you get a very standard acquisition fee, typically two to 3% of the purchase price of the property. Boom. That's, that's day one, you get that. An asset management fee, this is monthly recurring, not a property management fee, an asset management fee for managing the managers. Typically one to 2% of the revenue of the property, okay? Then you're gonna get on average 30 to 40% of the cash flow coming out of the property. That's on a monthly basis. So for putting in five to 10% of the money, you're gonna get 30 to 40% of the deal, okay? For 5 to 10% of the money, you're going to get 30 to 40% of the deal. So that's the cash flow. Then you're going to get 30 to 40% of the profits. If you have a sale of the property or a refinance, cash out, any kind of big capital events, 30 to 40% of that. Then of all the write-offs you're going to get from a tax perspective, you're going to get 30 to 40% of that. Then let's say you're doing renovation on this 10, 20 unit apartment building. Well, there's going to be a construction management fee built into your renovation costs. You're going to get about five to 8% on a monthly basis for construction management. Then let's say you sell the property down the road. Well, for managing and putting that together for you and your partners, your investors, you what's called a disposition fee. One-time fee, typically a half point to 2% of the sales price down the road. Not always, but sometimes, okay? Then on top of that, if you just want to be a good deal finder, like let's say you're like, screw this. I just want to go find great deals. Awesome. You can get a finder's fee, typically 1% of the purchase price. Plus you can get brought in sometime to the partnership, the main ownership partnership of the deal. Okay. On top of that, let's just say you want to raise some money. Like I don't even want any of this crap. I'm just, I just know people that know a lot, have a lot of money. Great. You can get capital fees, typically 3% of the money that you raise. Now, you also need to be involved in the ownership, but that's fine to be able to legally raise money for that deal. But that's for another discussion. So these are literally all the ways in a multifamily deal that you can go out and get paid. And I just wanted to show them, and I'm going to go through a few of them tonight, okay, to give you examples and actual case studies on deals that you'll see this happen, okay? So finding deals. Step one, finding deals. There are two ways to do it, only two ways. You can go direct to the brokers or direct to the sellers, direct to the brokers or direct to the sellers. Now, for the purposes of this and what we teach and how I learned it and how we executed on our first deals, direct to the broker, okay? Going direct to the seller 
is not a smart use of your time. Because I'm going to presume everybody in here has another gig right now, right? You're either got a W-2 position or another career or whatever it is you're doing to pay the bills for you and your family. And you're going to be adding this to the equation to hopefully make the transition at some point in time in the future if you want to. So doing that, this is going to be so arduous of your time and capital resources to do this. It works. It's just not smart use of your time given your position. For you here, it's direct to the brokers. Leverage their talents and their abilities to get access to the pre-market deals. And that's how you're going to find deals, pre-market or off-market, if you want to call. I'm going to show you how we're going to do that, okay? So direct to the brokers, the websites, and then you have pre-market, okay? So whether it's LoopNet, Crexy.com, CoStar, some of the other commercial websites out there. Let me kind of share with you just to give you an example, but this is Crexy.com. So this is a free marketplace. You can go look for commercial properties, right? Anywhere in the United States of America. Crexy.com, okay? Point being, the websites, that website I'm showing you and all the websites are only showing you about 40%, maybe even less than that, of the actual available properties for sale. Actual available properties for sale. At least 60% of the deals that are available in the marketplace, you never see. They are pre-market. They are sold in the pre-market to the database that the brokers know and the connections that people have with pre-market. They never even see the light of day of these websites. And why is that the case? Understand the life cycle of a multifamily deal. Here's how it goes down. They call me. because I get called all the time from sellers and brokers. Hey, Justin, we're seeing your property over here at 123 East Street. Looks like you've owned it for about three, four, five years. Loans come and due. We can see that. Are you considering selling it? Would you consider an offer on the property, Justin? All the time. All the time. And so at some point, depending on where we're at in that cycle, I may say, yeah, can you give me a broker's opinion of value? They're going to go ahead and send that to me based on their comps and say, okay, we think we can get X for your property, Justin. Are you guys considering selling? Okay, yes, we are. So now the broker has that deal in his off-market repertoire. He's going to prep it and get it all ready to go. And then he's going to send it out to his database of his investor friends, okay, before it ever hits a website, okay, ever hits a website. Majority of the time, it's going to sell in the pre-market phase. If you priced it decent and it's a good property, it's going to sell in the pre-market phase. If it does not, then it goes to the websites. So what does that mean? That means that most of the stuff on these websites sucks. That's what it means. It's overpriced or it's not that great of a deal or whatever it is, blah, 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 blah. And you know that. This is not something I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't already kind of intuitively know. And that's okay. It's not that things don't sell from the websites. It's that you're going to have to probably really negotiate those things well to get them into a price point that's going to make sense. And then realizing that how you actually leverage this process to get to these pre-markets is a little bit of, you're building some relationships. And I can show you exactly how to do that. So you're going to leverage the brokers on market deals. Okay, to get access to their pre-market inventory, their pre-market inventory. You're going to be focusing in the 10 to 30 unit space. So everybody in here tonight, if you have not done a multifamily deal, I'm not going to be having you go big 50 units plus. We're going to keep you targeted in that 10 to 30 unit range on average, under 50, 10 to 30 units. And that's where we're going to get you to execute because that's where you can actually get financing. If you don't have a lot of experience, you can get brokers to call you back that are more mom and pop brokers sellers to call you back that are more mom and pop sellers. You can handle the situation that's not that big of a capital raise, right? When you're gonna be raising money from yourself and other people. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So it's just more bite sizable. You can actually execute versus trying to, oh, I'm gonna go big. That's great, you'll get there. That's why we created the community, right? But you gotta start, right? Walk before you run. 10 to 30 unit deals. So here's how it goes down. Perfect example, you see this property right here. You see Melissa down here? Melissa Bousset, this is a property in Oklahoma. Hey, Melissa, how you doing? It's Justin Brennan from the Brennan Poli Group. Look, I'm looking at your 20 unit deal here on 2525 Northwest 38th Street. Uh, super interested in it. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Okay, awesome. Okay, been on the market, it looks like 180 days. I mean, do you have any active offers on the table currently? Nothing active, okay. Are you guys doing another set of tours? Like, what would be the best way for me to see this property? I'm very much interested in this area. Okay, you're gonna do tours. 
typically Wednesdays. Okay. Listen, I'm going to be out there in a week uh, touring a couple other properties as well. Can we set up a tour on Wednesday on blah, blah, blah date? Okay. And then they may ask you a few questions about you. Totally fine. But keep in mind what I'm doing. I know the property's overpriced. We know that. <laughs> But I'm leveraging to try and get into the relationship. That's how we got our first five deals, right? Was getting in exactly like that, touring a few properties in a market that we've designated. So in our case, it was Kansas City, Missouri. That was our first market we went into. I identified three properties with three different brokers in that market from the websites, made the calls, scheduled the tours, toured the properties. None of those deals worked out because they were all overpriced from the websites. But what I did do is build a little bit of rapport. Now, by building a little bit of rapport, learn, you know, I had to learn what to say, how to say it, all those things, but that's stuff that we teach. But once I learned all of that and I could do that, it wasn't that hard because now I get access to their pre-market deals. Now I start seeing stuff in my inbox and in my email that's not on the market yet. It's pre-market. I can underwrite it. It analyzes. It makes sense. So now we can make offers on it. And boom, that's how it starts to happen. But you have to leverage okay, the, the brokers on market to get to their pre-market deals. And you're going to focus in this space. Because that's how you're going to do it. That's how we did it. That's how we're doing it today. And you're going to do the exact same thing because it's going to be so much more efficient use of your time. Okay? So much more efficient use of your time. So now the next question is, what makes a good deal? So if I was analyzing something with a deal analyzer, right, a little Excel template, and I was trying to say, gosh, like what metrics make up a good deal? Well, it needs to fit in 14 to 20%. An annualized return on my money. If I give you $100,000, I need to see 14 to $20,000 a year on my money. 14 to 20%. Okay? Cash on cash of 6 to 10%. So what that means is if I actually give you hundred grand, I am physically getting back six to 10000 a year on that money. Physically. The annual return incorporates the cash you get as well as the appreciation of the property. So those two together get me the annualized return. The cash on cash is the physical cash on cash. Equity multiple, equity multiple, okay? It needs to be at 1.8 or more. What does that mean? If I give you 100 grand, Justin, I'm getting $180,000 back. I give you 100 grand, and let's say it was a 2X multiple. 100 grand out, 200,000 back. So that's kind of these metrics. And these are all built into deal analyzers. We have deal analyzers that we give out. All these metrics are built into them. Not a problem. Very easy. It's plug and play, all templated. And it tells you what to do. You just plug in the numbers real quick and it pops out all the exciting stuff for you. Okay. But these are the three main metrics that we start with. And then you can dive a few layers deep. But this is where you start to determine what makes a good deal. But that's what you're looking for. Because these metrics right here will be able to attract money from anyone. If I came to everybody on this, webinar this evening, and I said, hey, I have this 20-unit deal in Oklahoma. Here's the underwriting. Here's all the information on it. Based on everything we're seeing, it's producing a 14 to 20% return on your money. It's a minimum $25,000 to get involved, but that's going to receive a 14 to 20% annualized return on the money. We're going to return about 1.8x on your money, and we're going to give you cash on cash of 6 to 10% a year. Would that be something of interest to you? Because I know that otherwise, in the stock market, you're going to get about 8%. CDs, you know, other you know, treasury bills, 1%, 2%, 3% max, okay? So other investment vehicles, I'm having to compare it to those. And what is my opportunity cost of money? I know that these returns would be enticing enough, presuming you like the deal and you knew me enough to where you felt comfortable that I wasn't going to rip you off. Then you'd say, yeah, I'll give you 25 grand and it's going to, I'm going to have ownership in this 20 unit apartment building in this location, and this is the deal? Yes, you are. And then these are your projected returns. So that's kind of the stuff that goes on. And then you just need to understand how to actually go through the process of raising money. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But that is how a good deal is made. So analyzing a deal. Now, this is high level, okay? And we can get into the nuance of actual analyzing deals, okay? And we have deal analyzers and all that stuff for it. But how would you actually analyze it? Understanding that it's all about NOI. It's all about NOI, net operating income. Because unlike residential real estate, if you're trying to add value to a residential property, what do you do, right? You go in and you renovate it, you improve it, you do all those things. 
But then how do I establish value? What do I do? I compare my home to the other homes in the neighborhood and what they've sold for, correct? And that's how I establish what value may be for my property. Completely different in commercial, right? You could literally have two identical properties, literally side by side, identical condition, location, everything. One is producing $1 more than the other one, okay? That one's gonna be worth more money. Literally identical property, identical location, identical everything. This one is producing a net operating income of dollar more. It is worth more money because it's about the financials. It's not about how do I feel today? So you're taking the emotion out of it. It's all about the numbers. So not at net operating income, okay? So the power of NOI, to give you an example, for every $1,000, okay, for every $1,000 per month that I can boost that net operating income, that adds $220,000 right to my pocketbook. For every $1,000, I bump that. Think about it. If you had a 10-unit property and I was able to boost the rents 100 bucks a month, I just increased the NOI $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 a year. That's $220,000 in value. I'm going to show you how this formula works. The value of the building is equal to the net operating income over a capitalization rate in the market. Don't worry about how we calculate cap rates tonight. We'll get into that. But that's how it typically goes. It's V over NOI divided by C, okay? Without getting into too much crazy, just wanted to kind of show you that from a high level, okay? A lot of nuance in this stuff we teach, but this is how it works. V equals NOI over C. So that's how you actually get to that, that, uh, that formula. So let's break it down. This is a formula for how you actually evaluate a building. Once again, doesn't matter whether it's a two unit or a hundred unit plus, it's all the same formula, all the same formula. You're gonna take the gross income, gross income of the building, gross potential rents. You're gonna remove what's called economic loss. Economic loss includes physical vacancy, the thing called loss to lease, that's the difference between what you're actually getting in rent and maybe what the market is. Maybe it's higher, maybe it's lower. Maybe you the market rents a thousand bucks a month, but you're getting 900, lost a lease of a hundred bucks, okay? Lost a lease, bad debt, people don't pay rent. Concessions, I have to give people money or stuff to get into my complex. That's concessions. All of that, right, sums up to economic loss. And then you're gonna add another income. This could be pet rent, parking income, trash income, administration fee income, all these other income categories that boost your income using other income. And then you get to this thing called EGI. So that's effective gross income. Then you're gonna take out your expenses. This could be property taxes, insurance, repairs and maintenance, right? Contractor services, all the list of expenses. You don't have to memorize them. It's all in deal analyzers. You just plug and play, okay? Then you get to this beautiful number called the net operating income. That's what we were talking about. So remember, as we said, the value of the building equals the net operating income over a cap rate. Now, if you want to know what the cap rate was, cap rate equals net operating income over the value. So once again, it's a basic algebra problem. If you know two of the three, you can get to the third, okay? Once again, you don't have to figure any of this stuff out. This is all done with the deal analyzers. And then you take out your mortgage payment that gets you this cash flow number. But that literally is the formula for underwriting an apartment building. So any of these deal analyzers in Excel and all these things that you see, all they're doing is that in a fancy way, but that's all they're doing, okay? That's all they're doing. But that's how you analyze a building. And then you're getting to certain, you're trying to get to certain metrics, remember 14 to 20%, six to 10% on the cash on cash, equity multiple of X. So once you actually, these numbers get plugged in, it's gonna pump out the metrics to tell you whether or not it's a good deal or not. And that's it. So this is typically where everybody gets like caught because they, and I, I get it, I was there too. Our first raise, the, like the first time I raised money from anyone was on a 27 unit deal. Uh, we bought it for 2 million bucks, had about 200,000 in renovation. At the end of the day, we had to raise about $900,000. I raised about 900,000. We brought in 10%, okay? 10% of that's 90 grand. 
However, we also got acquisition fees of 3% on 2 million. You can do the math. 3%, okay, of 2 million is 60 grand. So 90 grand went in, 60 grand came out. We were technically out of pocket 30 grand. Make sense? I'm going to show you that actual case study here in just a second. But raising money. So that is how we did it. But the key to the whole thing is that you have a deal. Because without a good deal that makes financial sense, raising money is impossible. You can't do it. You're peeing into the wind. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> it doesn't work, right? So you need a deal that attracts the money. That's why I went into what attracts money. These metrics that I showed you earlier will attract money. It would, it would entice most people into learn more about the deal. But it's always about debt and equity, debt and equity. Um, this is what's called a capital stack, okay? Capital stack. So if you had a million dollar property for simple math, you'd have about 300K and 700K, right? 70% of that million dollars is a loan. 30% is the equity, the cash, the down payment, okay? That's what makes up how you buy the building, okay? So that's the, that's the capital stack. So when they say, when they reference the term capital stack, that's all they're referencing. How is the money, how is the capital stacked in the deal? So how do you raise equity? Well, equity is really brought into a deal in a few different ways. You can do creative financing. It could, seller could finance it. You can do some, you know, assumable financing. There's different ways to creatively finance a deal. Okay. There's investors, OPM, other people's money. That's how we do a lot of these deals, right? Us in conjunction with others, you know, pool money, we buy deals. Um, obviously your money, private lenders and partnerships. That's really the ways to, you know, put in equity and raise money in deals, raise money in deals. So this is how it's easy to raise money. If you have a deal that makes financial sense, and then you have a pitch deck, of which in that uh, toolkit, by the way, there's a pitch deck and a pretty good one. And a few other things in there too, a little toolkit to get you started on. Pitch deck and then a process. You have to have a process that's gonna bring people through, right? That have interest in investing alongside you. So a deal that makes financial sense, I mean, think about it. If I can produce, 14 to 20% annualized returns on all of your money in here tonight. Sounds pretty good, right? I just need a deal that makes sense and I need a trusted person, right? To invest alongside. So I don't think you're going to like take my money and run off and put us on an American greed show in two years. Okay. <laughs> That's the concept. So you got to have that kind of trust a little bit, but then also understanding that you have a deal that makes financial sense. That is kind of the broad concept of raising money, okay? It's the broad concept of raising money. So now let's actually take a case study, okay? I'm gonna take that 20 unit deal. Okay, I'm gonna take that 20 unit deal I was just showing you in Oklahoma. Here we go, we're gonna break it down. So they're asking a million 295, way overpriced, okay? We know that. But let's assume for, you know, our, deal tonight, we're going to buy it for a million 250. And we're going to have about $100,000 in closing cost. Inside of that closing cost is your acquisition fee, by the way. Okay. And then we're going to renovate the building 170 grand. I'm just throwing a number out there right now. Okay. So we're all in, right? Our all in cost is a million 520. Make sense? 1250000 100000 170 million 520. Did I do that right? Or did I have that totally wrong? Million two fifty, million three fifty, million four fifty. Yeah, I got that right. Okay. So how do we break that down? Well, once again, you're going to go out and get a seventy percent loan, a seventy percent loan. So that's going to be around a million one. Now keep in mind, you may be saying, "Oh, I can't get a loan like that." Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It is easier to get that loan than it is for you to go and get out a two hundred thousand dollar house loan. Why? Because the bank is not going to be looking at your financials as much. They're going to be looking at the property's financials first. They want to make sure, can the property pay us back? 
in the ex income and expenses, and then right the net operating income from that property, pay us our loan payment. Period. As long as it can do that and you're not a fraud, here's your money. Like it is not that difficult. Trust me, it's not that difficult. And then so let's presume for a minute a million five twenty, you get a loan for a million one. So now here's your equity. Here's your down payment that's left over. And you may be saying, well, how do I raise that four hundred twenty thousand, Justin? That's a lot of money. Well, here's how we're going to break it down for you. You, as the general partner, the sponsor of the deal, person that found it, putting it together, you're going to be bringing in about forty-two grand. That's about ten percent, right? Ten percent. Then you're going to be raising or finding three hundred eighty thousand dollars. Once again, this can be through creative financing, friends and family, investors and in OPM right? Private lenders, all kinds of ways that that equity gets put together. But you are coming in with 42 grand. Here's the fun part though. Remember these acquisition fees I talked about? This is where they become into play. So yeah, you may be out of pocket 42, but you get the check cut to you at the close of escrow for 37.5. You're really out of pocket $4,500. And now you have control of a 20 unit apartment deal in Oklahoma. You see how that works? So that is literally how you're going to break a deal down like that from a financial perspective, okay? So how do we structure this deal? Here's your structure. The property, the address, LLC, that's the building. You're going to have a, a single asset entity, a, a, an LLC that's going to own the building, a okay? single purpose entity as they call it. It's in the state in which the property is located in. So we would open up an LLC in Oklahoma. We'd name it. 2525 Northeast LLC in Oklahoma. So that's the property. Then you're going to have what's called general partners. That's you. And the limited partners, that's your investors, right? This is how it's going to structure. You're going to be bringing in 10% of the money. We talked about that, 42 grand, right? You're going to get 30% of the deal for that. We talked about that. Over here, you're going to be raising 90% okay, of the money. They're going to get 70% of the deal. They're also going to get what's called a preferred return. We'll get into that. If you have questions about it, we'll get into that. Don't worry about that right now. But let's say you got a check for 60 grand, and then you got some money for 150 grand, and then 25 grand, 100 grand, 75. And then you, keep in mind, what's really cool about this is you get to what's called double dip. Double dip. Meaning the money that you're bringing into the deal actually gets invested right alongside your investors so you get the benefit over here of the 70%, all these benefits. On top of that, you get this bonus of 30% on top. So you're getting to double dip the deal. It's really cool how it works. Then on top of that, you're getting all these ways of getting paid. Remember the acquisition fee? Boom. Asset management fee? Boom. 30% of the cash flow? Boom. 30% of the profits and cash flow? Boom. 8% preferred return? Boom. Then you're getting your percentage of the 70% of the cash flow. I mean, you get paid nicely. And we haven't even gotten into the taxes yet. You get that percentage of the taxes. So on and on and on and on and on. These are the different ways you're getting paid. So you're getting paid very handsomely. I'm going to actually show you a deal right now that I bought in exactly what I got paid, how I got paid, and when I got paid. I'm going to break it down for you so you can actually see it in a case study real time. Okay. Um, is this not cool or what? And it's, guys, you're creating wealth in a business and people want to invest in real estate. It's not a matter of that. It's just, you need to have the knowledge of how to execute and the handholding, okay? So you're not making any dumb mistakes and you need to have some capital, right? Not a lot. You need to have some money to put into deals. The whole thing of not having any money out of pocket and all these other things you hear on them for gurus, baloney. Like, is it possible? Technically, Yes. Is it realistic? No. So that's why we come to everybody and say, listen, you need to have 15 to 30,000 bucks to go invest to start this process. Okay. You need to have that because you need to have skin in the game because you're not going to attract any money from anybody if you don't have skin in the game. I'm sure you would all agree with that. Okay. So that's why this is really, really necessary. Um, beautiful. Yeah. So the next breakdown, I'm going to show you right now of what you can make as a GP. Here we go. So I'll briefly run through this. Closings, when you're going to go close a deal, 
These are the four things you're focused on. Inspections, legal, finance, and renovations. We're not going to focus on that tonight. Managing. Like, how do you manage a deal, right? You're either going to self-manage it or property hire a property manager, okay? Hire pro now, we have checklists. We have interviewing templates. We have everything on, hey, how do you hire property managers correctly? Questions to ask, why to ask them, and then how do you manage them, okay? So, but you want to hire a third party, ideally. You can self-manage. We can teach you how to do that. Ideally, third party, okay? Here we go. I'm going to give you a case study of a 31 unit deal that we bought and how for $18,000 out of pocket, uh, I own this, this deal. And I made nearly $600,000 on 18,000. Okay, here we go. Here's the breakdown. 31 unit deal, bought it for a million five twenty five. We did $400,000 in renovation. We had closing costs of about 225,000. We were all in at 2.150, okay? All in at 2.150. We went out and got a loan for a million five and some change. That was about 70%. Equity, this is the amount we brought into the deal. 645,000, that was about 30%. 10% was brought in, okay? Was brought in, about 64 grand. 90% was raised. Went out, showed them a good deal that made financial sense, raised that money, no problem. Five to seven people, no problem because we had projection returns north of 20%, right? If I can show you, hey, here's projected returns of 20% on your money annually, rock and roll, okay? So on top of that, for this, we got the acquisition fee. I believe it was about 45,000 if I wasn't mistaken. Yep. 45,5, okay? So out of pocket, $18,250, right? 64 went in, 64 is earning money, remember? Because we physically put the money in, but then a close of escrow, I got that back out. And that was built into the closing cost number right here of 225. So Peter to pay Paul, okay? So now I'm out of pocket $18,250. So what do I get for that? Well, 24 months later, we took the value by renovating it, right? We've renovated all the units, raised the rents. Now we have new income, new everything. The value of that building, because of the financials, went from a million five twenty-five to 3.6 million bucks. So we cashed out all of the money we put in. We did a cash out refinance, increased our loan amount, pulled all the cash out, tax-free by the way, right? In 24 months, I got an asset management fee while we were doing it for 1% of the income. 40% of the profits in the cash flow. I was making $2,000 a month for five years. That's 120,000 bucks. Net profits on the sale of about 470,000, 500,000, 590,000 on 18,000 bucks. 32X on my money for being a general partner, general partner. And this does not even include the cost, segre cost segregation and accelerated bonus depreciation. Doesn't even include that. Because that makes this number even stupid because I didn't pay any taxes on it either, okay? But that's the, that's the benefit of doing this, okay? But that's what I made on that, on this particular deal. Yes, Brian, most people's problem is always getting limiting belief systems. All of you in your mind right now, you're like, I don't have five to seven friends. I don't have anybody who has any money. I'm broke, they're broke, everybody's broke, broke. No, trust me, you're getting stopped. You're, you're literally mentally blocking yourself. You have to understand if you, everybody wants to invest in real estate, you would not be on this webinar if you did not. That's not the problem. It's just a matter of, does a deal make financial sense, right? Right, does a deal make financial sense? And on top of that, are you a fraud or not? Because if a deal makes financial sense, people will give you money. It's just a matter of, do they trust you too? People know people that know people. Don't think about your current circle of people. Throw that out the window. It's not about the people right around you. They may all be broke as a joke. That's not the point. If you have a deal and a pitch deck and a process, remember I told you earlier, if you have a deal that makes financial sense and you have a pitch deck to present that deal and you have a process that will help execute that deal, you'll raise the money. Trust me. That's also why, right? That's also why we start you at 10 to 30 units. Okay, I'm not, I don't want you going big because raising any more than probably somewhere between three to $500,000 Right or bringing in, right? Not even raising, but bringing in any more than three to five hundred thousand on your first deal, 
it may be an up, uphill leg for a lot of people. So we keep it focused because I know that if we can keep it right there and handhold you through that process to execute, you'll do it because you're going to find good deals. It makes financial sense. You're going to have a pitch deck and how to put that together and a process how to execute. You'll make it happen. Trust me. Okay. Stop limiting your belief system. It's the, one of the biggest things you got to throw that out the window. You will do this. You will do this. If you have handholding and it will execute and all that stuff, you'll do it. Okay. The mentorship community, what's involved in it? You're going to get lifetime access to it when you come in. Live weekly coaching. It's with me, not random hired people that don't know what they're talking about. We're going to be doing this in a very small, intimate setting every week. Okay. So you're going to learn it, hold your hand, walk you through it, get you to execute. We have a community where we're going to partner, right? We're going to find opportunities, ask Q&A. All the Q&A is going to go on, partnerships, collaboration. That is the whole design of the whole thing. That is what it's all about. You get a success coach assigned you. Typically, it's going to be Zach or Brian, but one of the two that's assigned you along with me. And we're going through this process, okay? 90-day guarantee that we're going to help locate a financial or deal that makes financial sense for you within a 90-day window, or you can request a refund on this if you want, okay? We want to put our money where our mouth is. We want people to feel secure in what we're doing and offer a ton of value to you so you can actually get this thing to work and not just fugazi fugazi. We want it to work for you because if you have success and you come in and we help you execute, what do you think is going to happen? We want partnerships. We want to grow. I'm trying to get to 10,000 units. You're trying to get to 100, to 50, to 20, all these things you guys were talking about tonight. In order for this to happen, collaboration, success, and partnerships have to go down. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Everybody has to win. It's a win-win. Success coach, all the resources and tools in the back end, everything you can fathom to buy an apartment building, you get. Deal analyzers, letters of intent, pitch decks, due diligence checklists, all the legal docs, everything you can possibly fathom is in there, okay? We assist you in finding, analyzing, funding, closing, and managing the deal, okay? Managing the deal. So to kind of keep it straight up for you, normally, normally, we charge 8,800 for this, normally, but I crossed that out earlier. We'll give everybody on the webinar, if you have some interest in this, for coming on, for 7,800 bucks, you're going to get all of this. Lifetime access to everything, 12-month mentorship with me, all the stuff we talked about. Click on the links. That'll give you the detailed breakdown of what's included. We're not here to sell mentorships and courses, but I have to know that you're well-trained so that we can partner and do collaboration and deals together inside the community. That is what it is truly about. And if you're ready to take that step and you're ready to make this happen, Make it a business. Remember, become a creator. Go make this house stuff that everybody's wanting to do. And then you're getting to the edge of the cliff and you're standing there and then you get paralysis by analysis. You've got to jump off and let the house show up. Nothing's going to happen if you just sit right where you're at and guess. So that's why we stack the 90 day guarantee to it because we want people to be like, okay, let's go in. Let's make this happen. Listen, we're going to help you find a financial deal that makes financial sense within a 90-day window or, hey, you can request a refund. Not a problem, right? But we're going to do our part. You need to do your part, right? It's a two-part show here. Let's go execute and make this happen. Some of you guys want deals by the end of the year? Perfect. Let's go make it happen. We still have time. First quarter of next year, not a problem. But we can go execute within a 90-day window if you follow a certain process, okay? And come inside the community. So that is really what it's all about. But click the link because that's, I mean, in summary, this is what it's, it's doing, okay? All this stuff is part of it. So to kind of summarize on that, and I'll, I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Lifetime access to everything. 12-month mentorship and coaching direct with me, okay, in a small group setting where we're going in and executing in a very nice little intimate setting every single week, and we're going through it. You're going to learn from other students and mentees in the program and the community, okay, who are already maybe doing deals and maybe you're not yet. You're going to see how that works in a very tight group setting of five to seven people every week. Very intimate, okay? Community to partner, all the Q&A, asking questions, all that, and a live active community. Success coach assigned you as well, as well as me. All the resources and tools, we're going to assist you finding, analyzing, funding, closing, and managing, and everything. Once again, the deal analyzers, you get all that stuff. Once again, click the link, you'll see everything that's included in grave detail. And then you can book a strategy call. If you have interest in this right now, put your name in your email privately, so do it to the host and panelists, to us, we can reach out to you. Your name and email and phone number are right in there right now. 
if you have interest and you want to do a little strategy session and talk a little bit more about it, okay? Talk a little bit more about it. Um, so uh, Adnan, you said closing a deal. Uh, I can't guarantee it closes, right? Because sometimes it takes longer to close. But 90 days finding a deal, that's correct. That's correct. It may take an extra 60, 90 days to close. But identifying a deal that makes financial sense in that window, yes. Answer your question. Yeah, so Brian, on the first deals, typically we don't partner because you haven't done one yet. But the whole point of coming into the community for the lifetime that you're in there is to let's handhold you, which we're going to do, get you into your first deal, even then get to your second, third, however many. I mean, we're here a lifetime. And then, yes, let's collaborate. Because we have a buy box, right? We don't typically do 10 unit deals anymore. We're doing 50 plus unit deals. So, but once you do your first couple, yeah, let's rock and roll. But we're going to handhold you through all of these processes, okay? How do you find, analyze, fund, close, manage? All the processes of going through buying a multifamily deal, we're here for you. That's what it's all about. If you're going to do a mentorship community, you want the handholding. It's not, anybody can sell you courses, guys. You can find all kinds of YouTube stuff, free stuff. That's great. And ours is amazing. But it's the intimate access and the hand-holding that's going to really drive the ship for you. That's the needle mover, okay? But yes, we do want to partner. The whole thing is partnerships. Yeah, I mean, we. let me give you a perfect example of how this works. We had one uh, mentee recently closed on their first 10-unit deal then a 20-unit deal, first two deals. Then they said, Justin, we want to go bigger. I said, awesome, let's do it. So they started sending deals in Oklahoma City for 100-plus unit deals that we're looking at now because they can't do it alone, right? They're newer. They can't take down a 100 plus unit deal, but they bring us in and we right collaborate and partner as general partners on the deal. And then maybe we even bring in a third as well. Now we can go take down a 100 unit deal and then we all have ownership of it. I mean, how cool would that be? You get your first 10 unit, then a 20 unit, you go from 30 units, okay? All of a sudden you get into a 100 unit deal because you collaborated right together. Now you have 130 units. Boom, I mean, it can absolutely happen all day long. And that's how you do it. You don't do it by doing it alone. We're not getting to 10,000 units alone. We haven't even gotten to 600 units where we're at today alone. Most of our bigger deals, actually all of our bigger deals have partners, two and three, two and three, okay? I mean, that is how you do these things. Um, if you wanna stay small, by all means, stay small. But if you wanna get into these kind of multifamily deals, remember five plus units, five plus unit deals, this is how you do it. So you can go in and execute, be the main general partner on your first deal, 10 to 30 units, do one or two of those. We'll be helping you out and holding your hand. Now let's rock and roll. If you want to go bigger, we're here for you. You want to stay small, we're here for you. Either way, we want to get you to execute. Because at the end of the day, it's about all these things. I mean, this is why I talked about this in the beginning, because this is it. This is the whole thing. You have to have a successful business. You're going to become a real estate business mogul. Successful business. Then you take whatever you're doing there and maybe there's some other things that are more passionate for you. Yeah, but you got to have the money to do it because the money gives you choices and the freedom to do it. But that's the key component. Without that, you're not going anywhere. You're just spinning wheels. But you got to do it inside of this. This is the big picture. Let's partner, baby. But in order to partner, we got to know what you, you got. We have to know you know what you're doing. But that's why we create the mentorships and coaching and all the stuff that we do, because we know that if we're handholding you and getting you to execute and have success, now we're like, okay, these people are trained. We can help them out. We're helping you. You're helping us. We're all winning. That's what it's all about. Make sense? I, I'm currently in California. I'm in San Diego. Our first deal was in the Midwest. Um, we want to look at New Jersey, by the way. So by the way, first thing that happens when you come in is we do an onboarding business uh, strategy session because I want to identify what markets you're looking at, why we want to target the right markets. New Jersey may not be the right one, mainly because of the landlord tenant laws. So we want to look at that and taxation. Okay, that's why we don't invest in California as much anymore. We're, most of our stuff's out of California now. So New Jersey may be the same issue, New York, that type of stuff, but we just look at that. We're not completely out of it, we just got to look at it. Any other questions, Q and A that I can help answer for you either about the community and the mentorship, or about multifamily in general, anything at all, we'll give it like five more minutes here and answer any other questions. But remember, the link is in there. You can look at it. You can book a free strategy call just to discuss it and see what's going on. But I want you to know everything that's part of it. 
Uh, and I want you to understand from a bigger perspective what we're doing. We want a community of well-trained investors who are doing deals together. That is, that is the ultimate, call it BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. And it's happening now, and we're just growing it. So I love that. Because, I mean, that's passion to me. For me, that's passionate. Because that hits the fulfillment side of education, right? Media, family, business. For me, that's my main driver. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Love it, love it, love it. I'm glad everybody had a good time. I have no idea how the debate went. I don't even care. <laughs> I mean, oh, uh, I mean, if, if you, I don't know if you feel like me, and I'll just say this, you know, briefly. I think most Americans are actually probably libertarian for the most part, in a way, meaning fiscally, safety, security, probably a little bit more conservative. But when it comes to social issues, maybe a little bit more progressive and liberal. I don't know. Um, but I think most people can get along. And I think, as I'm sure everybody agrees, there's too much, right? Too much division and polarization. Let's come together. Let's unite as a country. Let's go make things happen. Everybody win. Equal opportunity for people to have chances. Maybe not equal outcome, by the way, equal opportunity. So hope everybody had a good time. We do have a recording of this. It will be recorded and put up in a few days. So stand by for that. And click on the links, get your free multifamily toolkit, number one. Number two, strategy call if you want to. Guys, jump off the cliff. Jump off the cliff. Allow the how to show up. You can do this. You can totally do this. So let's make it happen. Thanks, everybody.